church here in Dorston is dedicated to St Faith, whose day is celebrated on October the 6th. Church dedications have changed through the centuries and there's evidence that the church here was dedicated to St Peter, St Thomas, St Mary certainly in 1889 and then St Faith from 1910. One big change in this border area was when the Normans arrived. They didn't recognise the ancient Celtic saints and so rededicated the churches they rebuilt. So it is possible that the Celtic saints and Tefoi was the original dedication here and it was interpreted as Foy, their own well-known Saint Foy. Early in the 9th century, a small abbey built on the site of a former hermitage in the wilds of the Aveyron region of France was on the decline. In 866, the abbey procured, stole, according to the chronicler, the relics of a young virgin martyred in the 3rd century, Saint Foy. And miraculously, thanks to the saint, the little abbey lost in the middle of nowhere began to prosper. The holy martyrs, represented by their relics, served to intercede between God and the faithful. Their miracles intervened in every phase of daily life. They healed the sick, made the lame walk, protected the harvest and guaranteed truces and treaties. And in exchange, they were venerated, just like some said, pagan idols. Saint Foy, who was reputed to give back sight to the blind and freedom to prisoners, was very successful. Pilgrims flocked to Conk, and soon the ancient abbey church was too small. A new one was needed, bigger and more beautiful, both to honour the saint and to hold the crowds of her supplicants. Saint Foy of Conk was born in Agen, in Aquitaine, at the end of the 3rd century of the Christian era. A large-scale persecution of Christians under Diocletian began a few years later. The Christian Bishop of Agen managed to lead some of his congregation to safety in the hills, but faith was captured. It would have seemed easy to force a 12-year-old girl into giving up her faith and to make sacrifices to their pagan gods. As she was tortured on a red-hot gridiron, she made the sign of the cross and shouted, I am prepared to suffer everything for Christ. I long to die for him. Legend has it that at once heavy snow filled the air around her, hiding her body from the onlookers until she had died. The story of her martyrdom spread quickly through the whole region and her relics were stolen and placed in Conk Cathedral. You can see how pilgrims came from far and wide and en route was Conk Cathedral, where St Faith's Shrine became more and more popular. Even in this largely secular age, this pilgrim way is well travelled. Its final destination is Santiago de Compostela, where the relics of James the Apostle lie. St James is believed to have travelled to evangelise the people of Spain. This pilgrimage was the third in importance after Jerusalem and Rome. By the Middle Ages, it was estimated that a quarter of a million pilgrims annually travelled the route. At the end, they often went to the coast and picked up a scallop shell as a memento and it became the symbol of their pilgrimage. The ribs of the shell show how all routes led to the shrine of Saint Iago. the beautiful reliquary that is paraded through the streets. It holds the skull of Sainte Foy. Gold is linked to martyrdom and connects us to the spiritual world. At her feet is a sacrificial lamb and the crucifixion scene. The head is thought to have been made from a Roman funerary mask. This use of Roman artefacts connects the statue to Rome, the seat of Christianity and its great riches. Soon after the purges of Diocletian, Emperor Constantine declared Christianity the official religion of the Roman Empire. Here is our sister church of Bacton, also dedicated to St Faith. 
Inside is this monument. On the left is Blanche Parry, a local woman who was Queen Elizabeth's nurse and close companion for over 50 years. To the right is a very rare sculpture of her beloved mistress, Queen Elizabeth I, who became, of course, Supreme Governor of the Church of England. Does Elizabeth's statue remind you of anything? Surely it's not a coincidence that it's exactly in the style of the reliquary of St Faith. In the next village is Dor Abbey. The present parish church is all that remains of the huge Cistercian monastery, all dedicated to St Mary. Over 50 churches in Herefordshire are dedicated to Mary, the Holy Mother. You can understand why she became the focus in the early church for the pagans who converted to Christianity. They were devoted to goddesses and particularly Mother Earth. So Mary the Virgin is the embodiment of purity. In the Greek and Russian Orthodox churches, she is greatly venerated. This is a roof boss which has survived in Dor Abbey from the 13th century, and here Mary is being crowned Queen of Heaven and Earth by Jesus himself. Hereford Cathedral is dedicated to St Mary the Virgin, and images of her appear everywhere. This icon you see is in the Lady Chapel. In our deanery, the Abbey Door Deanery, nine churches are dedicated to Mary, Clifford, Craswell, Cusop and Kent Church. The others are Kilpeck, which shares a dedication with St David, Tiberton and Walterstone. Madley is dedicated to the Nativity of the Blessed Virgin and is huge for its location and hosted thousands of pilgrims who came to see a famous statue of the Virgin, which was in the crypt. The church was also dedicated to Eberdil, who was the mother of St Dufrig, also known as Dubricius and Devereux, and he was one of the most famous of Herefordshire's Celtic saints, and he founded Amocus Church and was the first Bishop of Landaff and Archbishop of Caerleon. St Margaret of Antioch lived at the same time as St Faith and during the persecution by Diocletian. She's shown as a shepherdess in part of the east window. She was minding her Christian guardian sheep when she was spotted by the Roman prefect who wished to marry her. Then he found out she was a Christian and renounced her. She was thrown in a cauldron of boiling water, thrown on a fire, and when this didn't persuade her, she was imprisoned. She called on the devil to show himself, and he did in the form of a dragon, and swallowed her up. She made the sign of the cross and burst out. She was finally beheaded, however. 5,000 converted to Christianity on her death and remission of sins is granted if a church is dedicated to her. Turnerstone is dedicated to St Mary Magdalene. Mary Magdalene was demonised and degraded in most of the versions of her life, portrayed as a reformed prostitute. In the Gospel of John, however, the risen Christ gives her special teaching and commissions her as an apostle to the apostles, taking to them the news of the resurrection. Literary tradition suggests that historically Mary was a prophetic visionary and a leader within one section of the early Christian movement after the death of Jesus. The catacombs of St Priscilla in Rome show evidence of the importance of women's ministry in the early church of the 2nd and 3rd centuries. St Priscilla herself is mentioned in Paul's letter to the Romans. Ten of the 29 church leaders whose favour Paul seeks are actually women. The top fresco depicts a woman deacon in the centre with her arms raised in the position for public worship. To the left there is a woman being ordained by a seated bishop in a chair. She is vested in an alb, chasuble and amice and holding a gospel scroll. The fresco below shows women celebrating the Eucharist and their hands held out in the process of blessing the elements. These words of St Paul are often used as evidence from scripture against the ordination of women. Women should remain silent in the churches. They are not allowed to speak, but must be in submission as the law says. I do not permit a woman to teach or to assume authority over a man. She must be quiet. This attitude to women was the tradition in Jewish life and should be seen in the context of the times. 
As Christianity became more mainstream, worship moved from the private space of house churches where women were free to public spaces where they were not. This patriarchal culture of the times and men's position had to be preserved. But it went further. By the early Middle Ages, women were seen as dangerous temptresses, all because of Eve. Adam immediately blames Eve for his disobedience. It was the woman you put with me. She gave me the fruit and I ate it. Significantly, God punishes both of them and they have to leave paradise. Fast forward to 1994 about 1,500 years after women were gradually airbrushed from the hierarchy of the church. Here at last women are ordained, but not without considerable animosity. Another 20 years pass before women are ordained as bishops. To conclude my talk, I've chosen four women of faith whose actions changed people's attitudes. Harriet Tubman, she now appears on the $20 bill instead of Andrew Jackson. She was born into slavery in Maryland and escaped following the Underground Railway escape route, walking 90 miles to freedom. She saved many slaves this way and had several roles during the Civil War, including being a spy. A new film has just been issued about her extraordinary life. Elizabeth Fry also appears on a banknote appropriate as her father was linked with Gurney's Bank and her mother's family had links to Barclays. She met an American Quaker when she was 18 and from then on devoted her life to the poor and oppressed, especially in prisons like Newgate. She also campaigned against slavery. Harriet Beecher Stowe brought the anti-slavery cause, long thought to be just a province of a few fanatics, into the mainstream. She asked that everyone should speak out against slavery. I hope every woman who can write will not be silent. In 1852, Uncle Tom's Cabin was published and then republished with 300,000 copies. It became the bestseller of the century, second only to the Bible. In 1862, she met Abraham Lincoln, who greeted her by saying, so you are the little woman who wrote the book that started this great war. I've chosen a lesser known woman, Susanna Wesley. She was the 24th of 25 children and had 19 children herself. She preached from her own kitchen to large crowds of followers and her sons, John and Charles Wesley, brought about a huge reawakening of Christian witness known as Methodism. When John and I visited Kolkata in 2019, we saw these women helping in the streets. You may recognise them as followers of St Teresa of Calcutta, who was awarded the Nobel Prize in 1979 and canonised as a saint in the church in 2016. So saints are still among us to this day, some recognised, some not, but their power to change lives is extraordinary. There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither bond nor free, there is neither male nor female, for ye are all one in Christ Jesus.